The Artemis 1 launch began with the fueling of the rocket last Tuesday, November the 15th, in the afternoon. Now, they had encountered numerous problems with uh, hydrogen leaking during the fueling of the rocket in previous launch attempts. Uh, and then they experienced subsequent delays from Hurricanes Ian and Nicole. Uh, they had to, for, I for Hurricane Ian, they had to roll the rocket all the way back from the launch pad to the vehicle assembly building, um, which incurred multiple weeks of delay. And then uh, fortunately they made the decision that, that a rollback was not necessary for Hurricane Nicole. But, um, uh, and so Nicole only delayed the launch <clears throat> by a couple of days. But uh, starting last Tuesday afternoon, they began with a kinder, gentler, I think is what they called it, uh, approach to fueling the rocket. They fueled it slow and steady, uh, thus mitigating the, uh, the leaking problems they had been having previously. They were putting too much pressure on the system, and because hydrogen is a very small molecule, it uh, leaks through just about everything, and so if you have it under pressure, it's going to squeeze out through all the, uh, the cracks. Um, and so they did fuel the vehicle successfully, and at 1.04 a.m. Eastern Time on Wednesday the 16th, they launched. Let's check that out. ...on its maiden voyage to the moon. Launch team can no longer recycle the count. Sound suppressor water now flowing 15. under the ML. And here we go. Ten. Hydrogen burn-off igniters initiated. Seven, six, five, four-stage engine start. Three, two, one, boosters in ignition. And liftoff of Artemis One. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. All four RS-25 engines on the core stage and two solid rocket boosters now propelling the vehicle at 128 miles per hour. Hearing good, con good control on the hull. So lots of uh, familiar uh, YouTuber names, um, uh, What About It, uh, Everyday Astronaut, and others were, on, and Red's Rhetoric, and others were on site for the historic launch. And... Um, the reports from the ground were that it was incredibly powerful. Like they, you know, these people had seen many launches before, but nothing like this. Uh, uh, Felix of What About It said that he could literally feel the air moving in and out of his mouth from the from the uh, the pressure of the of the launch a few miles away from his location. Um, so you know what, Corley, you are exactly right. Uh, the launch was delayed a few minutes. It wasn't 1.04 a.m. It was 1.47 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, yeah, I had forgotten there was a short delay. Normally, I don't stream launches uh, that are late at night in my time zone, which is the same as same time zone as Kennedy Space Center Eastern Time. Uh, but <laughs> I wasn't about to miss this one. If it had launched at 3 or 4 in the morning, I still would have streamed it. So it was a gorgeous launch. The rocket performed perfectly. And uh, uh, coming up soon here, we should see the booster separation. So if you're not familiar, the SLS rocket produces a total of 8.8 .8 million pound force of thrust at liftoff. Now, the majority of that is provided by the two solid rocket boosters, which are uh, essentially the same type of rocket. There we have uh, boosters separating from the core stage. Uh, the boosters are essentially the same type of boosters that were used on the space shuttle, except they have, instead of four segments long, they have a fifth segment, so they can uh, burn for longer. But uh, uh, you know, the boosters separated perfectly, and you see there, once they... Uh, if you're not familiar with solid rocket propellant, once you light it, it's burning to completion. You can't, you can't throttle it. You can't do anything with it except let it burn. And so, um, 
that's what you were seeing at the end there was the the last remnants of the solid rocket fuel uh, you know, sputtering out the the nozzles of the uh, boosters now if we fast forward let's see here hold on we got just over three minutes we have Miles okay, hour. speeches. Okay, so uh, similarly, core stage separation. I'm not sure where it is in this video, but similarly, core stage separation. Um, the core stage burns for about eight and a half minutes. Uh, and so, what are we at here? What's the time? T plus 207, 208. Okay, so we just got a, I guess they didn't have a video downlink at the time. We just got a computer animation of the, uh, the core stage separation. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, now if we fast forward to 90 minutes after the launch, and this is sped up a little bit, the SLS rocket's upper stage performed the translunar injection burn escaping the Earth's orbit and sending it coasting towards the moon. Uh, the four solar arrays on Orion were folded back into their stowed configuration during the burn, as you can see here. All four of the solar arrays, as you can see, are swept back. That's going to keep them from having any loads imparted that might damage them. Uh, I'm not actually sure why they um, stow the, the solar arrays like that. It's not like they're encountering atmosphere because they were uh, well into space at this time. But... Um, I also don't know why this is wiggling. Uh, so the camera is located on the tip, or cameras on the tips of the solar arrays. And uh, maybe they were, I don't see the arrays wiggling there, so I'm not sure what that uh, wiggling we saw was from. But there we can very, very clearly see that the uh, thrust, the um, TLI, the translunar injection burn, is being performed. Now, uh, another item of note, those solar arrays are not in the exhaust plume. They are further up on the spacecraft. So the exhaust plume is some number of feet or meters uh, below or behind the uh, tips of the solar panels, as you can see here in this graphic. Okay. Now, one hour and 58 minutes after launch, the Orion spacecraft separated from the upper stage. The Space Launch System rocket's job <laughs> was done. Uh, then, nine and a half hours after launch, Orion beamed back some beautiful and historic images of Earth from a distance of about 57,000 miles, or 92,000 kilometers. The first time that Earth had been imaged from a crew-capable spacecraft beyond low Earth orbit in 50 years. Not since Apollo 17 in 1972 have images like this been beamed back to Earth from a crew-capable uh, spacecraft. And in that view, you can see some of the uh, uh, the, RC, the little RCS thruster nozzles and uh, the other thruster nozzles on the bottom, the business end of, of the Orion spacecraft. Uh, here we have a view of the inside of Orion with uh, the Moonikin, as they call it, uh, dummy in the Artemis space suit or the flight suit on the left in the seat there. Uh, they have at least two, I think. I'm not sure if they have four, but they have at least two cameras on the tips of those solar array wings, quote unquote. Um, so the solar arrays are kind of like very expensive multi-purpose selfie sticks. Uh, and that's the Artemis footage we got this week. Uh, obviously the mission is continuing and I'll talk more about that later in the upcoming part of the broadcast. But, uh, but for now that is all we get to see from Orion. If you want to track Orion in real time, that is the, or the Orion spacecraft from the Artemis 1 mission, uh, just search for Artemis Tracker, and uh, NASA has a page where you can view a 
rendering of the spacecraft with uh, the Earth and the Moon and the Sun uh, all positioned appropriately so that and with uh, telemetry data so that you can see uh, the relative speed and distance uh, distances of the of the spacecraft from Earth and the Moon. Now, looking ahead to this Thanksgiving week, it's going to be a really freaking busy one. So let's get started with the Artemis live streams. On Monday, November 21st, starting at 7.15 a.m. Eastern, 12.15 UTC, is live coverage of the Artemis 1 Orion spacecraft's first powered flyby of the moon. You can watch it right here on Raw Space. Wednesday, November 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern, 1600 UTC, NASA will broadcast Artemis All Access Episode 2. Now, I had set up a live stream for Episode 1 a couple of days ago, thinking that it was going to provide lots of detail about the mission status and upcoming milestones, but the so-called episode aired an hour and nine minutes late and only lasted for a few minutes. Uh, they pretty much just showed where the Orion spacecraft is on a trajectory graphic, and that's about it. So I won't be streaming any more all-access episodes, but you are free to watch them on NASA TV. Then on... Where is it? Do I not have it on here? Okay, well, I'll just speak it then. Then on Friday, November 25th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC, is coverage of Orion's distant retrograde orbit insertion burn, which will secure its orbit around the moon, where it will remain for a couple of weeks until it returns to Earth. Uh, there will be a live stream here on Raw Space. All right, let me get to your questions. Rockin' Robins 13, Raw Space. How about the NASA command, no photographs of the mobile launch tower, capital NASA's, capitals NASA's after the launch. No photographs of the mobile launch tower? I am not familiar with the command, no photographs of the mobile launch tower. Did they say that on the stream or on a sign or something? Uh, maybe you can clarify, but I'm not familiar with that. Um, Yoda what? Is it even legal for NASA to try to preclude photos of what taxpayers have paid for? Uh, well, that depends on whether, I mean, <laughs> that depends on whether uh, it's classified. I mean, they can't prevent people from taking pictures of the mobile launch tower. That's not really possible. There's tens of thousands of people watching the launch from all over the place with giant zoom lenses and telescopes and everything else. So, um, uh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't have any idea what that's about. And they, I mean, they can't like the payload itself, you know, there are obviously classified payloads that get launched. I mean, you can watch the launch, but you can't like get a secret view of, of the payload itself for like national reconnaissance office satellites and whatnot. But, uh, as far as the mobile launch tower, that doesn't make any sense. There's nothing classified on the thing um, that I'm aware of as someone who has no clearance anymore. <laughs> Used to a long time ago. Any photo of moon from Orion spacecraft? Uh, I haven't seen any photos of the moon from Orion. I mean, it's well over halfway there. It's, it's almost all the way to the moon at this point. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll be flying by the moon. Um, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow morning. But as far as photos of the moon, I'm sure that NASA has photos of the moon. I'm sure they haven't just been ignoring the cameras on Orion. But for some reason, NASA's coverage of this incredibly important, incredibly delayed, and incredibly expensive mission called Artemis 1 uh, has been sparse. Like, they had a big, you know, a big show... Uh, around the launch, but ever since uh, the end of that broadcast, you know, shortly after the launch of SLS, there's been very little. I mean, there was just uh, a very brief piece. On, I mean, they, they've they've been they've been showing like 
documentaries about the moon and you know information and things like that but not like live coverage of what's going on with orion right now uh except for um you know, again, basically a heads up as to where it is in its trajectory, <clears throat> which last, which was the all access episode one that was just a few minutes long. And then the, the uh, sneak peek about the upcoming powered flyby of the moon, which uh, uh, was informative. But um, yeah, in any case, I'm sure NASA has pictures, but if they have been sharing them with the public, um, I haven't seen them. Now, with that said, I've been kind of busy and I haven't been trawling the, uh, the, the NASA Artemis website for new content. So uh, if, you, if you go to their website, um, you, you might find something. But um, good question, though. Uh, MVM Motovlog Music. Uh, you're so right regarding the Artemis coverage. Okay, thank you for the support. Um, but Stephen A says, no, they were saying that it's hard to downlink because of so many users on the deep space network. Um, that sounds feasible. Uh, the deep space network is overtaxed, I think. They need some new installations. Oh, Marcio Cumplido is saying the launch tower melted. Oh my gosh, what? I hope that's not kidding. Because, I mean, I hope that is kidding, because uh, if the mobile launch tower was severely damaged, then, uh, um, then uh, well, I guess their next Artemis launch isn't for another couple of years, so they have time to fix the thing. Maybe they can replace those stupid hydrogen quick disconnect valves so that they uh, don't have so many leaking issues. Um, as for requesting that people not take pictures of the mobile launch tower, I think it's kind of too little too late. Like there's already cameras pointed at the thing taking tons of pictures. So, uh, I'm sure there's no shortage of, of pictures of the damage floating around the internet. 